cloud. So, um, and I, I will also uh, connect you to the, um, I, I will enable you to um, to share the screen in a moment. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I, I would like to um, wish you, <laughs> in the name of the um, Center of World Christianity here at SOAS, a happy new year. And uh, uh, if you are part of the Orthodox uh, world, then uh, a belated uh, uh, Merry Christmas. Um, um, we have, um, it's the beginning of the second term, if you think in university terms, or if you're in the semester system, it's the end of the, it's the end of the first semester, the summer semester. So it's a, it's in a way a very, um, uh, it's a time of transition. And I think um, it's a very good time to talk about um, uh, the, um, uh, the topics that we uh, discussed uh, in the first term uh, in a different light. And this uh, uh, today, uh, Alison uh, uh, Ruth Kolosova is going to introduce a, a topic which we uh, have not really talked about in the same sense, so, uh, so uh, it's a um, within the Russian Orthodox tradition, and um, she has a, um, a made a name for herself, uh, we are familiar with herself in the, in the context of the IOTA um, uh, seminars, and um, uh, also uh, most of them, uh, the recent ones, I've sent to the uh, center, so you, you will already be familiar with, uh, with these uh, seminars. Um, and um, she has uh, experience both in, um, uh, uh, on the linguistic side, but then also in theology, which she accumulated both in, um, uh, in, at Durham University uh, and um, in Paris at the St. Sergius Orthodox Theological Institute. Um, uh, affiliated to the University of Tartu in Estonia. Uh, she's um, uh, she, she, but resident in Russia, so she's familiar with um, uh, both the um, academic aspects of uh, Russian Orthodoxy and um, the, the lived um, uh, church life in uh, Russia and in the world of uh, Russian Orthodoxy. I will not say much more uh, of the topic. I think we anything else we can bring up in the uh, discussion that follows. And now let me just share this with you. Um, one moment. Um, I'm going to make you co-host. Okay, okay. Did this little green button uh, appear? for sharing the screen should be at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, very good. So um, so the format is, uh, because it's a lunchtime session, many people uh, can't make it. Erica Hunter, uh, the former uh, 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 chair, woman of the, of the uh, Center for uh, of World Christianity, she sends her apologies. She has, um, uh, she, she has uh, something important going on in Cambridge today. Um, but uh, she would have liked, very much liked to be here today. Um, also, uh, some I received a, another few apologies. Um, also, we have a few people who can't log on because that's a per permanent problem with the um, uh, Zoom system that we have here. So um, for this reason, we're recording this session and I'm very happy to pass the word on uh, to um, uh, Alison Kolosova right now. Uh, thank you very much. Could I just um, ask how much time I, I have? How long do you usually have yes, your session? It's, it's usually uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, or less, if you like. And then, um, uh, if or more, if you have a lot to say. Um, and, and then we will add um, uh, anything up to a half an hour afterwards in terms of discussion. Right. So, usually um, about just over an hour altogether. Is that right? Yeah, you, you, because it's. Um, I, mean, I hope it won't take me too long. I, yeah. I usually find that when I go, if we go beyond that, uh, you will see that people will be dropping out. But this okay. is uh, yeah. this is recorded, so it's uh, it can be it can go on as long as you like. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it, it's um it's very good to be with you here today, and uh, uh, particularly to meet Romina, who uh, I wrote an article for. Uh, a year or two back and that was a very good experience for me and it provoked a lot of Hello, reflection for me. Uh, so, um, 
دخلت بيا ما اعرف افتحها اوكي وي جوت سمبدي ايلس اون لاين اي ثينك سلمى اي ثينك ام جوين تو ميوت يو يس اوكي سو ام much worldwide reflection has been provoked recently by the many centenaries of assemblies and texts which have turned out to be landmarks in the history of global mission and improved ecumenical relations between Christian confessions. The years following the bloodbath of World War I were particularly fertile in efforts towards internationalism at a time when the breakup of three empires had brought to the fore the principle of national self-determination. This was reflected among the Christian churches by important statements which called for healing of divisions and a new pursuit of unity. The 1920 Lambeth Conference uh, appealed to all Christian people, called for a reunited Catholic Church of all who profess and call themselves Christians. The encyclical of the Patriarch of Constantinople to the Churches of Christ Everywhere, also issued in 1920, called for a strengthening of love and fellowship, koinonia. 1921 saw the first meeting of the International Missionary Council at Lake Mohonk, the fruit of the work of the Continuation Committee of the 1910 Edinburgh Missionary Conference, which highlighted the need for concerted action and closer fellowship if the missionary task of the churches was to be accomplished. Edinburgh's call for cooperation in the sphere of mission is widely viewed as an important step towards the movement for faith and order uh, and the movement for life and work, which led eventually to the creation of the World Council of Churches in 1948. The American historian Paul Vallier argues in his 2012 book, Conciliarism, a history of decision-making in the church, that this renewed desire for inter-church dialogue and collaboration and all the many ecumenical conferences and councils that it spawned were Protestantism's contribution to what he terms the 20th century conciliar renaissance. He considers the Vatican II Council of the Roman Catholic Church and the 1917 to 1918 Moscow Council of the Russian Orthodox Church to have been the two great events of this 20th century conciliar renaissance. All these gatherings and the scholarship they encouraged led to a renewed emphasis on consensus-based decision-making and conflict resolution. And I, I quote Valier, by means of councils, formally constituted translocal leadership assemblies called together to resolve issues affecting the life doctrine and ministry of the church. While Valier discusses expressions of this conciliar renaissance throughout all the Christian confessions, he nevertheless asserts that uh, the renaissance had its origins in Russia. This may surprise many owing to the lack of Eastern Orthodox involvement in the Edinburgh 1910 conference and the lack of Russian involvement in the other famous ecumenical conferences and texts of the 1920s. While this may seemingly be explained by the turmoil of the 1917 Russian Revolution and the civil war of the early 1920s and the general lack of fellowship between churches in East and West, the picture is not so simple. It was amidst, and in fact, because of the chaos of the 1917 revolution, that one of the key events of Valier's conciliar renaissance, the 1917 to 1918 Moscow Council took place. In this paper, my aim is to explore why Valier considers the 20th century conciliar renaissance had its origins in Russia. And in the process, we shall explore some of the events and debates which led directly to the 1917-18 Moscow Council and also followed in its wake in the 1920s. We shall get, I hope, something of the view from Russia during the early decades of the 20th century, which have proved so pivotal for the Western Church's mission and ecumenism. And I shall seek to raise the question of whether the churches in East and West were facing similar issues, in fact, and if so, why? Uh, I shall do this by focusing on a concept and practice which has come to be extremely significant in the history of both Russian philosophy and theology, uh, that of subordinate. 
This is a peculiarly Russian word, which in recent times has been translated as conciliarity or conciliar conciliarism, although it is a word with rich, complex meanings to which we shall return in a moment. We shall see how the pursuit of conciliarity or subordinate provoked intense debates within Russia over the nature of the church, its unity, governance, relations with the state and mission from the mid 19th century onwards and culminated in the 1917 Moscow Council. As my own research is connected with the missions of the Russian Orthodox Church, Rather than focusing on the key conciliar event of the 20th century in Russia, the, Mos the Moscow Council, I shall explore some of the forms that this pursuit of concil conciliarity took far from the empire's capitals. I will illustrate how the pursuit of conciliarity intersected with missionary activity by focusing on two expressions of conciliarity in the mid Volga region around Kazan, a region with an indigenous Turkic and finno ugric population, which had been a mission field for the Russian church since the conquest of Kazan in, 19, in 1552. The first of these expressions of conciliarity is the missionary conference, which took place in Kazan in 1910, during exactly the same days, in fact, as the Edinburgh 1910 conference. Uh, the second is a process which was taking place amidst the turmoil of the 1920s, when Orthodox Christians of the Turkic Chuvash people sought to establish their own Chuvash episcopate and diocese. And I'd just like to emphasize that I am sitting in Chuvashia at the moment, so this explains some of the uh, particular focus of what I'm talking about today. Um, so, first of all, uh, what is subordinate? What does this word mean? Um, the root of the term subordinate is the verb sabirat, which in Russian is to gather or to meet together. And this explains why in Russia, a, a large church or cathedral is known as a sabor, as it is where all the faithful gather together. This notion of gathering or meeting explains why the term sabor is also used to refer to a church council, a gathering of all the leaders of a national church, or of the entire church at ecumenical councils to deliberate and reach consensus about church doctrine or government. The English word conciliarity has frequently been used to translate subordinate when it refers to this conciliar or collegial form of perceiving truth and applying it within the church. The word sabor has the adjective uh, saborni or saborna in the Slavic languages. And it is because of the connotations of this adjective that the word subordinate has been uh, complicated to translate into English without losing some of its wider, rich overtones. The reason for this is that when the texts of the Greek church were translated into Slavonic, a process associated with St. Cyril and Methodius in the ninth century, the word sabornia or sabornia was used to translate the word kafolike, Catholic, one of the attributes of the church in the Nicene Creed. So where the creed reads in English, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the creed reads in Slavonic, I believe in one holy sabornia and apostolic church. Um, now, what is fascinating is that while the words sabor and subordinate have been used from time immemorial in the Slavonic languages, the noun subordinus was only coined in the 19th century, and its origins are associated with Alexei Khomiakov, uh, a lay theologian and philosopher who traveled widely in Western Europe, engaging in debate with Protestant and Roman Catholic theologians. It was in this context uh, that in the 1840s, he wrote several theological treatises, the most famous of which has become known as the Church is One. And in these writings, it is the meaning of the Catholicity and universality of the Church that is his central concern. We see this in a famous passage where he explains what it means for the, for the Church to be subordinate. And he writes, the church is called one, holy, uh, sabornaya, and 
uh, in the text is actually as Catholic and universal, apostolic, as she is one and holy, as she belongs to the whole world, not to any one particular locality, as all of humanity and the entire earth, not any one people or country are sanctified by her as her essence consists of the concord and unity of spirit and life of all her members who confess her throughout the earth. As in the apostolic writings and teachings are contained the fullness of her faith, hope and love. We see here how Homiakov understood the church's Catholicity as both a geographical universality but also a qualitative feature of concord and unity of spirit and life. And for Homiakov, it was only amidst such concord and unity of spirit and life that divine truth could be collectively perceived by the entire universal church. He asks in one famous passage, is it not to the church gathered together in its entirety that understanding of the divine truths is given? For this reason, Khomyakov emphasized the significance of church councils when rep representatives of the church gather and deliberate together to resolve conflicts. But he also broadens out this communal perception of truth at councils or synods to include the entire people of God, the body of Christ. And Khomyakov writes that the ultimate source of truth is the Holy Spirit, who dwells precisely in this gathering of the church as an entire people. As I explained above, Khomyakov was actually writing to polemicize with Western theologians. The thrust of his treatises, which were written originally in French, is a call to Protestants and Roman Catholics to return to an undivided church where the fullness of truth can be known. Yet his writings also proved to be very popular at home in Russia. Not only popular, but explosive, I would say, and so explosive that when they were first published in Russian translation in Moscow in the early 1960s, publication was banned after two treatises. So why were Khomyakov's writings considered to be so subversive in Russia? One reason for this was the ill feeling felt over the system of church government introduced into the Russian church by Tsar Peter the Great. In 1721, Peter had abolished the patriarchate and created a holy synod made up of lay government officials and some senior bishops with a lay official as it, at its head. Um, and this subordination to secular church control, sorry, to secular state control was deeply resented within the church, especially by the bishops who were to a great extent deprived of governing church affairs. From the 1860s, during the period of liberal reform, which saw the abolition of serfdom, several influential articles critical of Peter's synodal system made proposals to restore independence to the church by replacing the Holy Synod by a council of bishops led by a patriarch. There were also proposals to restore conciliarity at the level of dioceses and metropolitan region, regions by holding assemblies of both clergy and laity to deliberate on local matters. Komiakov's writings on the conciliarity of the church gave renewed impetus to this debate, much of which focused on the practical implications of the term subordinist. The late 19th century debate over how to reform the church and restore subordinist came to a head amidst the revolutionary turmoil of 1905 to 1906, which saw Russia paralyzed by striking workers and intense violence in both city and countryside. This troubled period led to the October 1905 manif manifesto, which created the representative body of the state Duma and also granted civil rights such as freedom of conscience. In April 1905, a decree on religious toleration lifted restrictions on non-Orthodox religious communities and legalized conversion from Orthodox to other Christian confessions and to Islam. 
In response, Orthodox Church leaders pointed out that the Orthodox Church had not received the benefits acquired by other religious confessions and requested that they also be freed from the control of the secular authorities. This request led to a much bolder memorandum from the president of the Committee of Ministers, Witter, who denounced the synodal system of church government, which had reduced the church to an institution of state. And he stressed that the church needed to reg regain the freedom to manage its own affairs through restoration of conciliarity. This led the Tsar eventually to agree to holding a church council at some time in future, although he stressed this was am impossible amidst the current violence. Nevertheless, the Tsar's agreement to hold a council unleashed an intense debate throughout 1905 to 6 about the aims and compositions of such a council, broader ideas about church reform and the very nature of the church and its subordinate. Some wanted the National Church Council to be an assembly of bishops only and viewed with suspicion any participation by the laity or the lower clergy while others wanted the laity and clergy to have not only a consultative role, but to be able to vote on key issues. Some emphasized that subordinates was not just the calling of a council, but was also rooted in the life of local parishes with active participation of the laity. Others called for councils in metropolitan regions to promote conciliarity at the local level while some taking their inspiration from Khomiakov himself emphasized that the church was the entire spirit filled people of God. Now these debates about church reform were not only taking place in Moscow and St. Petersburg and in the church seminaries, intense debate was raging throughout Russia and it was reflected on the pages of provincial journals and newspapers. When a request was sent in 1905 to the diocesan bishops asking for their opinions concerning church reform, the bishops in the major cities of the mid Volga region, such as Kazan, Samara, Simbirsk, and Ufa, overwhelmingly supported the participation, participation of their priests and laity in a national council. Yet they also called for decentralization of the church by creating local organs of church government with representatives of clergy and laity. For example, uh, Bishop Christophor of Ufa, which is today the capital of Bashkortostan, uh, where the, the people are largely Muslim, um, he declared that reform demands that the foundation of the church should be the conciliar principle inspired by the idea of brotherhood in Christ with a patriarch at its head. He emphasized that the impl implementation of the conciliar principle should begin from the grassroots and the implementation of the idea of brotherhood together with the conciliar principle should of course begin from the parish community as the basic ecclesial unit. The majority of the population in these dioceses of the mid Volga region were not in fact Russian, and since the 1960s there had been a missionary movement spearheaded by the Kazan linguist Nikolai Ilminsky. He promoted the translation of biblical and liturgical, liturgical texts into the local Turkic and Finno-Ugric languages, and he promoted the education of indigenous teachers and Orthodox clergy. Amidst the intense debate of 1905 to 6, we begin to see how the issues raised by the church reform, and reform movement were viewed by this emerging native intelligentsia in, in journals such as the Kazan based Life of Church and Society. For example, uh, Nikolai Nikolsky, a Chuvash lecturer at the Kazan missionary courses, stressed that Christians should not show prejudice towards others those of other nationalities, and that native languages of the mid Volga should be heard in churches. A Churash priest from Samara diocese, Father Anton Ivanov, and uh, in the photo, he's uh, the one on the, the far left. Um, he explained how assemblies of missionary priests had become a feature of native church life, 
and enable priests to resolve issues through common efforts in a brotherly way. He emphasized that the deliberations of such gatherings could make a vital contribution to a future national council on issues relating to the non-Russian peoples. There was also a clear call for national leadership in the mid-Volga region. One anonymous author in the journal suggested that the percentage of the native population should be taken into account in the formation of metropolitan districts and two native bishops should be appointed in the Kazan diocese, a Turkic Chuvash who also sp spoke Tatar and a Finno-Ugric Mari who also spoke the Finno-Ugric Modvin language. And another anonymous article argued, and this is quoted on the screen, the appointment for the Orthodox natives of bishops from their own background will raise their sense of self-esteem. They will finally stop seeing themselves as a lower race, unworthy of having their own national bishops and forced to be eternally under the guardianship of others, and will stop seeing orthodoxy as a means of Russification. Uh, but this, this journal, along with all other reform-oriented journals, was closed down in the reactionary atmosphere of late 1907. The All Russian Council promised by the Tsar in 1905 was not summoned, while proposals for ecclesial decentralization and native bishops were frustrated for the next decade. Um, and it was against uh, or in the midst of this reactionary atmosphere that the Kazan 1910 missionary conference was called. Um, so first of all, why was there a missionary conference in Kazan in 1910? Um, we've already seen some of the reasons for this in, uh, in that Kazan was the center of the Russian church's Orthodox, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church's missionary work in the region. Um, and here's a, a few kind of brief dates which help to fill in the background of that picture from the early 9th, 10th century. Islam had been preached in the mid Volga. And before 1552 and the Russian conquest of Kazan, the Kazan Khanate was ruled by the Tatars who confessed on the whole Islam. Um, the peoples who were subject to them within the Khanate, so the, the finno ugric peoples and the other Turkic peoples, such as the Chuvash that I've mentioned, uh, largely retained their, their own animistic practices, although uh, certainly influenced by Islam as well. Um, after the Russian conquest of Kazan, um, for several centuries, uh, the uh, the peoples of the region, there was not really any official uh, missionary work, although there was Russian settlement in the region and the building of churches and monasteries and schools. Um, and, but then from the 1740s to the 60s, um, most of the non-Russian population of the mid Volga uh, were baptized en masse into the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, I say most because uh, most of the, the Muslim village were, villages were left untouched. Um, but this led to a particular problem that throughout the 19th century, um, there were constant petitions from the baptized non-Russians to be reclassified as Muslims. Um, and it was also against the, the background of the 1905 uh, revolutionary turmoil that a degree on religious toleration was passed. Um, this affected all the, the Christian confessions without Russia, but in particular it, it allowed those who had been secretly practicing Islam, um, but not really allowing, uh, not allowed to, uh, to openly confess Islam, uh, were to finally openly confess their faith. Um, and about 49,000 people of Turkic or finno agric origin uh, petitioned to become officially Muslim by January 1909. And this was one of the main reasons uh, that the, the Kazan 1910 Missionary Conference met. And the main issue really was uh, 
that there was a fear that there would be a complete re-Islamification of the mid-Volga region. Uh, the conference's keynote speech were, was on Islam, and it highlighted the strengths of the Muslim communities, the high literacy rate, the extensive network of schools, printing presses, libraries, and reading rooms, international ties with schools and publishing houses in Egypt and Turkey, uh, mullahs who spoke the same language and led the same lifestyle as their flock. Uh, there were also subsections devoted to Islam in the recently annexed Turkestan and to the Muslim press. Um, amidst uh, this main theme of the conference, uh, two dissonant visions of mission emerged, uh, dissonant visions, visions of mission with contradictory consequences. Um, one was a view of mission, and this was very much promoted by the, the representatives of the Synod at the conference, of mission as one aspect of collaboration between church and state with the aim of promoting state unity. And uh, this view of mission very much uh, saw the assimilation of local identities as, as the main uh, policy that mission needed to have. Uh, but in opposition to this, uh, this vision of mission was uh, a man who became particularly famous at the 1917-1918 council, but at the time was uh, a vicar bishop in the Kazan region. And this was Andrei Ukhtomsky. Um, he had very much a vision of mission through the laity, through parish communities and without state interference. Um, he had been very influenced by Nikolai Ilminsky, and he very much promoted the enculturation of orthodoxy into local languages and cultures, very much under the inspiration of, of Nikolai Ilminsky. Oh, I managed to miss out a a slide, sorry, with, uh, with the photos of, of Ilminsky. Um, anyway, a little bit about who, who was Ilminsky. Um, the first Ilminsky schools using indigenous languages opened in the 1860s and were followed by the founding of the Kazan Teachers Seminary to train teachers for native language schools in 1872. By the 1880s, a number of former pupils and teachers from the schools and seminaries were being ordained as Orthodox clergy. So by 1910, there was a modest contingent of indigenous clergy and lay teachers who had developed out of the movement. And about 40 of Ilminsky's native followers were among the 242 official delegates of the Kazan Conference. Some of them, such as the Chuvash Nikolai Nikolsky, led and took part in sections on translations into Turkic and finno ugric languages, native schools, uh, missionary attitudes to the traditional rites and beliefs of the mid volga peoples, and the response to Islam, while a particularly authoritative Chuvash priest, Daniel Filimonov, gave a speech during the opening ceremony. Yet we must not be lulled into thinking that the presence of so many of Ilminsky's native followers at Kazan 1910 was simply the result of a successfully implemented policy to indigenize orthodoxy. During the decade prior to 1910, they had become an articulate voice in the church press defending use of native languages by indigenous personnel in churches and schools against charges of political and ecclesial separatism from those who advocated mission as a means of assimilating the native peoples. So they had come to Gazan really to defend their cause. And the anonymous articles I mentioned earlier proposing native bishops and dioceses were most likely written by one of those writ uh, present at the Kazan 1910 conference. Yet it is a symptom of the reactionary atmosphere in which the Kazan 1910 conference took place that these proposals for native leadership at the diocesan level were not aired. Um, 
despite the Kazan conferences, the Kazan conferences inability to provide a conciliar forum where the issue of native leadership could be discussed. The fact that indigenous clergy and teachers from the Turkic and finno ugric peoples of the mid Volga made important contributions to deb debates in Kazan was an expression of a local conciliarity in itself. The next time we see the concerted action of this band of Ilminski's followers is in national assemblies held against the background of the 1917 revolution. And you can see some of this on the screen now. Um, when, and at this time, they gave free rein to their views, some of which were undoubtedly rumbling beneath the surface at Kazan in 1910. For example, at the initiative of Nikolai Nikolsky, the Union of Volga Minority Peoples held its first Congress in March 1917. According to its statute, it aimed to defend the interests of national minorities, achieve national self-government, a national literature, a native language, education. Its aims for the church were in line with the more radical views of the church reform movement, a church separate from the state, autonomous parish communities, national dioceses with an indigenous episcopate, elected priests and bishops. At a Congress of the Chuvash National Society in 1917, it was the Chuvash priest Daniel Filimonov who drew up the agenda for the section on the church, which resolved that in areas with a compact Chuvash population, there should be Chuvash bishops of separate dioceses and Chuvash clergy and laity should be represented in diocesan and district councils. These events took place in the context of diocesan councils of clergy and laity across Russia. Um, and these councils took local church affairs into their hands with some of them removing their bishops and electing new ones. They also took place while the 1917 to 198 Moscow Council met. One of its most important actions was to restore the patriarchate and elect Patriarch Tikhon as the first patriarch. Many, however, were critical of Patriarch Tikhon's negative stance towards the new Bolshevik government. And among them were a group of progressive clergy known as the Renovationists. They declared loyalty to the new Bolshevik government and its aim of combating socio-economic injustice, which they considered was rooted in the gospel. Yet they also called for separation of the church from the state. When the new patriarch Tikhon was arrested for counter-revolutionary activity in May 1922, the renovationists took control of the church. At a national renovationist council, in May 1923, they defrocked Tikhon and replaced the role of patriarch by a synod of bishops, priests and laity. So one of the key renovationist demands was that the church should be governed in a conciliar manner rather than by a patriarch. Let us now return to the creation by the Chuvash of a national episcopacy, uh, episcopacy and diocese. This seemed to Chuvash Christians to be a logical step after the uh, creation in June 1920 of a Chuvash autonomous oblast uh, or region, which gave the Chuvash some degree of political autonomy. Many of the Chuvash clergy had great sympathy with the cause of the renovationists. And it was the rene renovationists who gave the Chuvash clergy permission to hold a regional assembly of Chuvash clergy and laity to create an autonomous Chuvash diocese. Two of those present at the assembly in March 24 had played active roles at the Kazan 1910 conference. In a long speech, Nikolai Nikolsky justified the creation of a na national diocese with historical examples of indigenous leadership. One of the two bishops elected for the new diocese was Daniel Filimonov, who had represented the native clergy at the opening of Kazan 1910. But the new diocese hit problems before it was created. 
Patriarch Tichon was released from prison in June 1923 and a year later appointed another Chuvash priest, uh, German Kokel, as bishop, giving him the task of drawing the Chuvash parishes back to the patriarchal church. After Tikhon's death in April 1925, there was a return en masse of bishops, clergy and parishes to the patriarchal church. And so the Chuvash diocese, created with the blessing of the controversial renovationists, began to lose ground. It was in this context of seeming failure and frustration over the creation of the Chuvash diocese, combined with despair at the ecclesial anarchy which was shattering the wider Russian church, that the Chuvash bishop, Daniel Filimonov, and we, can, we see him here in the picture, uh, read a report, Patriarch and Synod, on 11th of July, uh, 1926, and he read this on the steps of his church uh, on the banks of the River Volga. Um, now, interestingly, uh, his key argument wasn't so much really about um, the creation of a native diocese, but his key argument was that the council had been the hallmark of church government down the centuries, called at crucial moments to resol resolve conflicts over controversial issues. While he did not use the term subordinate, his arguments revolved around what it means for the church to be subordinate, both in the sense of conciliar and synodal forms of church government, and in the sense of the wider universality and Catholicity of the church, which embraces all peoples of the world, including the Chuvash. He gave an overview of how disputes had been resolved through the practice of conciliarity, starting from the Council of the Apostles in Jerusalem in Acts 15 and continuing with the Ecumenical Councils. And he concluded with the, uh, the quote that you can see here in the, on the screen, the truth can be more easily discerned by several people than by one alone. The definitions and decisions of conciliar power are more authoritative than the decisions of single-handed power. The decisions of several people together are much more impartial than those of a single person. It is more difficult for the powerful of this world to influence several people than one person. Anyway, I think my time is coming to a close, so I will just um, say in conclusion um, that it might be assumed that the very different ecclesiologies, theologies, and historical experience of the Russian Orthodox Church and the Western Protestant churches would mean that in the early 20th century, they would be facing very different issues. Yet churches and missionary societies in both Russia and the West had for over a century prior to 1910 been propagating the Christian faith in new cultural, social and linguistic milieu in the context of empires. The transmission of faith uh, through schools and education translations into local vernaculars and through indigenous personnel had led in varying degrees to indigenous Christian communities and native leadership, which by the time of the two 1910 missionary conferences in Kazan and Edinburgh, and even more so in the 1920s, were questioning and even rejecting missionary tutelage and its accompanying, accompanying cultural and political baggage. This meant that by the early 20th century, churches in East and West not only faced common challenges relating to the church's witness and dialogue with the world, but broader issues concerning the nature of the church itself, its Catholicity, its capacity to remain unified amidst cultural and linguistic diversity and its relationship to secular power. And this is one major reason that the issue of conciliarity, the issue of how to maintain unity amidst diversity became a common concern at this time and an issue particularly brought to the fore amidst the missionary expansion of the churches. So, uh, thank you very much. And um, yes, th thank you. Very glad to uh, to welcome uh, your yes. questions and hear your comments. Uh, 
Well, well first of all, thank you very much for this uh, very powerful lecture. I was, um, I, 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 I was uh, magnetically drawn to every single line that you said. It was um, a very uh, interesting and also very historical lecture. <laughs> so it's, uh, we um, have um, uh, a lot of questions that I have in my head, but I'm sure there are other people who want to, um, uh, who I would like to give uh, the privilege of starting, uh, who, who would like to, um, oh, John Binns has to leave. Uh, so yes, so uh, th thank you very much for, for coming. Um, uh, is there, are there any other questions? Would, who would like to ask the first question? Shall I stop my... Uh -huh. Yes, if you stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Nice to see Richard Penwell here. Yes. I, I, I have an immediate question. Maybe you, uh, we can start. Uh, you, the, you allude to the political changes that are taking place at the, uh, uh, you know, during this time of the, um, uh, of the, um, Synod, not the synods, but the, um, the, the conferences which uh, discuss uh, a, um, uh, an economic, uh, ecumenical approach to, um, uh, to to Christianity and especially the um, future of the Russian Church, I guess. Uh, but uh, th there are uh, th were there any direct changes that were caused by the uh, October Revolution? Because that and of course the civil war that is ensues, the war between the white and the red, so-called white and red Russians. Um, because uh, I, I would imagine that this in a way, um, perhaps also split the church. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, perhaps I, I, I didn't make that clear enough. I should have kind of included the uh, the dates of the revolution happening, but the um, where I explained that the uh, the Chuvash began to hold their, or they they created uh, this uh, uh, kind of union of minority Volga peoples. I mean, this was March, 1917. So it was very much, I mean, that, that couldn't have taken place really before uh, the events of February, 1917. So uh, yes, over the summer of 1917, we see a kind of, I mean, not complete ecclesial anarchy, I would say, but in an awful lot of dioceses across Russia, uh, we see, uh, local diocesan councils taking place and in a way that you know a di direct response or consequence of the debates about subordinate um, because beforehand the, these councils you know hadn't existed um, um, we not only see them taking place and I mean in some places they were reasonably conservative they kind of met uh, in a uh, in a reasonably kind of friendly manner but it, in other places they they literally uh, you know, just got rid of the, the former bishop for, you know, for conservatism and elected uh, a new bishop. Um, so the, the debates taking place among the Chuvash really are, are you know, are kind of part of this broader picture. Um, I mean, in some ways today in Chuvash here, these debates among the Chuvash are uh, kind of hushed up. Uh, you know, there isn't much interest shown in them, uh, particularly by the, the official church. I mean, there are a few, there are a few scholars who have been working on the texts um, of these meetings. Um, but, you know, largely because they're, they're kind of, they're seen as um, kind of Chuvash separatism, Chuvash wanting to move away from the, the Orthodox Church, which in fact they weren't. I mean, they, they wanted to create their own uh, autonomous diocese. Previously, they'd been part of the Kazan diocese, but uh, wanting their own bishop within, within that diocese was their own. But, you know, it needs to be seen very much against the background of the 1917 revolution. And then, yes, again, in the 1920s, um, this, the creation of the, the renovationist movement, which took control of the church uh, uh, from, from Patriarch Tichon. Again, this is you know, largely the result of political events. Um, the government is trying to discredit the church in general. So we see the, um, 
um, I've forgotten what it's called in English, but the uh, when they were they were taking the uh, all the the church plate from the churches, kind of uh, supposedly to you know to to kind of finance uh, the uh, the state, um, and uh, and it's really you know because of Tichon's response to this that he is uh, he's arrested and imprisoned and for counter revolutionary activity. Um, and that gave the renov renovationists the uh, the chance to take power in the church. So this group of progressive clergy, and it's really with their kind of uh, their blessing that the the Chuvash uh, created their own diocese at this point. So everything is very much kind of intertwined with the with the political events. It's a very very complex time. I mean, I I had I, I spent a long time just trying to kind of. Uh, reduce this very complex time down to you know a few events that you know make it not too complicated because uh, all kinds of things going on yes thank you that was a, a an answer that I, I would like to follow up later but uh, but first we have a question a long question by Rumina I, I'll read it out because it's on the um, uh, it's part of the uh, chat um, I wonder, what are the implications of these historical debates within the Russian church for contemporary ecumenical efforts and approaches? That's the first question. Maybe you would like to answer that one first. So for yeah. contemporary ecumenical efforts and approaches. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, on the one thing, on the one hand, I, I think we need to see um, that um, in many ways, the, the debates about a council in 1905 arose out of this 1905 uh, decree on religious toleration. Um, I mean, I didn't have time to dwell very much on this, but in, in many ways, you could say that this was, you know, the the, the Russian state's uh, attempt to improve ecumenical relations. I mean, they weren't being called ecumenical relations then, but to kind of pursue a more tolerant attitude uh, towards obviously, you know, the Baltic states with, you know, Lutheranism, um, the, the Ukraine and Catholicism. Um, so, uh, the 19, you know, the nine, the debates about the 1905 council in a way were a response to that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, on, on the other hand, I would say that uh, these, these events of the 1920s and the, the rise of the renovationist movement, which today is very much a, uh, seen as a you know a schismatic movement by the official Russian Church, um, have I think have contributed greatly to the fact that the uh, the Russian Church today, whilst it kind of um, in one sense uh, promotes ecumenical relations, but I would say that at the grassroots level within Russia you know, an awful lot, the vast majority of Russian Orthodox are very kind of hesitant about um, having any relationship, uh, any kind of form of ecumenical relations. And obviously we see this in, um, I was reading an article uh, just recently about the, uh, the problems of the seminaries that are, have been created for non-Orthodox uh, confessions in Russia today and the problems they have with getting, being registered. And, um, and, and I think a lot of this uh, kind of hesitancy in general about ecumenical relations dates back to these events of the 1920s and the, the renovationist movement. Um, because the renovationist movement, apart from obviously taking into its hands, you know, control from, from Tichon, um, it did have a, a fairly kind of ecumenical viewpoint in some of its uh, manifestos. Uh, it talked about unity with the other Christian confessions. So, 
unity with con Christian confessions is often looked back to today by many, by well, some Orthodox who know something about the renovationist movement, uh, but even those who don't know anything about it uh, will will say, "Oh, that's renovationist." You know, uh, long before I even I ever studied the renovationist movement, I heard this term among the people uh, that I'm living among, and I would sometimes ask, "Well, you know, who exactly were these people? You know, why are they called that? What were they saying?" And nobody could really tell me, to be honest. Um, or they told me very little. So it's become a kind of, uh, you know, label that is um, kind of foisted onto anything that is kind of uh, progressive within the church, you, you could say. Um, so it's things like, you know, the calendar issue as well. That That's another issue that is because the renovationist movement also um, promoted use of the new calendar. And it, it was used for a while at this time. Um, and then uh, the church as a whole went back to using the old calendar, which is why we're celebrating Christmas on January the 7th rather than uh, December the 25th, as is the case in many churches, in, you know, in, in many Orthodox churches, I mean, in Romania, in Bulgaria, which at that time, at this very time, the early 1920s, um, you know, went on to the new calendar. Um, so many things that are kind of viewed as, you know, kind of modernism, if you like, and that, you know, involves the calendar, it involves ecumenical relations, kind of been, you know, tarnished really by the, the brush of these renovationists. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that's answered your question. <laughs> it's too long answer to your question. It was very detailed. Thank you, Alison. No, that, that was very educational as well. And I was wondering because, um, you know, I had done a bit of research on how uh, you know Protestant denominations are being um, sort of viewed in Central Asia, not Russia specifically, and um, they're you know they they don't have a formal status. They're being persecuted. That's a term that is accurate. I don't know, but that's a term used by the uh, Watch organizations for religious freedom. So I'm not sure how you know to what extent that applies. But in general, it wasn't. It was viewed by suspicion, and I think you're what you're talking about is this deeply ingrained, ingrained memory that, that this is something bad that happened, something threatening to orthodoxy, what orthodoxy might mean in the mind of the ordinary believer, right? Um, and so I think it then becomes a label, as you say, that is being kind of politicized in, in, in new historical contexts so re, so sort of re reintroduced every time, but in slightly different, with sl slightly different political motivations, if that makes sense, yeah. uh, which we've seen in Greece, we've seen in other contexts as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, and there's a second question if you have the yeah, time. You have, a, you have the second question. Uh, just ask your second question. <laughs> yeah, we're, yes. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I, you know, I've, I've also read your paper on uh, Ilminski's work um, uh, with the Kazan, uh, you know, missionary. Um, uh, 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 seminary, sorry, seminary. Um, and I just I appreciated your nuanced analysis, you know, in terms of how Orthodox is spread to non-Christian, indigenous minority peoples, very much implicated in political, sort of top-down political events, right? Um, but also at the grassroots, le grassroots level at the same time, uh, we see that Orthodox activity actually kind of uh, concerned itself with preserving, you know, local languages and understanding the vernacular, vernacular life of the, you know, the indigenous life of the communities. Um, so I think that kind of raises the need for a more nuanced uh, understanding and analysis and approach to the relationship between missionary activity, imperialism, uh, and uh, enculturation. That's the term you used. Um, so I think that kind of, I think that that has the potential to direct the field, to move the field in new directions, because I think it's it's been quite a simplistic in a sense that, you know, by default, missionary activities associated with enculturation and destruction of indigenous life, right? And one of one of the arguments we made in that volume that was that we kind of co-produced was that um, is that uh, you know not all missionary not all missions are the same first and foremost because the theology that informs the missionary activity differs within contexts, considering you know Catholic missions or Western missions in general within colonialism. Uh, versus, you know, Orthodox missions within Russian imperialism or Orthodox missions, uh, you know, by the Greek the Greek uh, churches or Syrian churches. So that's very different. Um, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on this and what what your suggestions would be 
in how we move forward this field and how we analyze this relationship between missionary activity and culturation and imperialism or colonialism. Because again, the, the very notion of colonialism is debated. What does colonialism mean? And does it apply to Russian imperialism? You know, what is the difference between imperialism and colonialism essentially? So again, that's another question, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts and uh, suggestions. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Romina. And obviously this is a, a big issue of my research and uh, it's something that I really, you know, ended up being faced with, particularly when I was writing my PhD. I, th I think I started out with a, uh, perhaps, a, you know, a very simplistic view of the Russian missions. I, I mean, I think that's partly because very little work has actually been done on the Russian missions. And so people like Nikolai Ilminsky in the, uh, the kind of overall kind of books about Russian mission, you know, he perhaps get a, gets a page or two and it tends to be, oh, you know, what a wonderful job we've done. You know, we, we translated everything into the local languages and, you know, this wonderful Orthodox mission. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I have, enormous respect for Nikolai Ilminsky and for what was going on. Um, and I, I don't doubt that this was, you know, an, an amazing kind of work. Um, and really, it, it was something very kind of innovative and revolutionary for the time. And, and of course, he, he's been uh, kind of branded with the label of being a Russifier, you know, which, again, was kind of when I started looking into what actually people were writing about him apart from, you know, in the kind of the orthodox uh, missionary books, um, you know, you, you begin to be faced with the question, well, you know, why is he being branded as a Russifier when, you know, he was helping everybody to, in, uh, to translate uh, things into their local languages and not only translating, but helping them to preserve their languages. And largely today, you know, people look to his disciples as the people who have, preserve their languages and cultures in the mid-Volga. So, I mean, the, this picture I've painted today of the uh, his Chuvash disciples being very much involved in creating um, autonomous dioceses and being involved in the political events of creating political autonomy. I mean, this was a picture that was similar throughout the mid-Volga region. It wasn't just the, uh, the Chuvash. Um, it was the finno ugric peoples as well, and to a certain extent, you know, even the Tatars, even though the majority of the Tatars uh, are Muslim. Um, so, um, yeah, so anyway, to go back, you know, I, I started off myself with, with a fairly kind of simplistic view of the missions. Um, and really, it was only through beginning to, you know, actually look at the archives and, you know, you suddenly read this... Um, you know, for example, the, the last text that I, I quoted from this patriarch considered and see that, um, you know, people like Father Daniel Filimonov, uh, Nikolai Nikolsky, you know, they, they were at the heart of, uh, of political events at the time. Um, and, and this really had, you know, completely arisen out of, uh, out of the missions. I mean, it, it wasn't just that they kind of, you know, became... Um, uh, kind of became Bolshevik, um, you know, it, it was something that emerged kind of organically out of the mission and the fact that they had been given their own uh, languages, the fact that they, they had higher education, um, you know, they became this very articulate uh, intelligentsia at the time and were, were fully involved in the political events of the time. Um, so it, it, it does... Uh, Yes, I mean it. You know, it uh, it kind of shatters. I think the yes, the simplistic views of Orthodox mission. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I, that's answered the question again. Thank you so much. Mm. Are there any immediate questions? I, I have another one. <laughs> uh, that goes back to the, the the very first slide that you showed, where you uh, talked about the synods, the um, uh, and the reaction to this uh, the synods who who actually go against the Bognos. They, they have um, the the um, th th that was the state trying to um, institute a, um, a centrally organized hierarchical um, decision making uh, process. Um, 
Mm. It's during that time that the uh, uh, Russian church is being used as a, a symbol of uh, Russian identity, which is then taken by uh, um, the, the Alexander to, to the, the, the corners of Russia where, sorry, of the empire, the Tsarist empire where the Russian uh, influence was as it, at its weakest. So I think the um, idea that the um, uh, the Orthodox Church is an influ is um, an instrument in Russification comes from that time, and it's very interesting to see that the um, uh, the um, well the 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 counter uh, current that you have uh, the reformist counter current that that actually goes precisely the other way that it's in, uh, got an indigenizing um, influence. Um, it, it's very interesting. I mean, this is something that should actually be. Uh, uh, highlighted more um, uh, more prominently in the historical uh, press as well, you know, in the because most of the um, um, history um, publications that I'm familiar with, they uh, they just identify the state with the church during this period, and and that is yeah. obviously yeah. A, you know an error. Yes, much too far too a simplistic uh, a picture. Yes. Yes, and I, I would agree with you that it, it was uh, Ilminski's main uh, kind of mentors, if you like, although he, he didn't actually meet them. Well, he met one of them, were um, uh, the, the missionary uh, Makari Gulkaryov, who was in the Altai mission, uh, so on the border with Mongolia, and uh, uh, Bishop Inakenti, or Innocent uh, of Alaska, who ended up becoming the Metropolitan of Moscow during the time that uh, Ilminski's work was just becoming, uh, kind of getting established. Um, and obviously, yes, on, on the borders of the empire, on the one hand, if you read their texts, they, they also, to a certain extent, they're patriotic Russians and they're doing it out of a desire to, to bring these peoples more fully into the empire. And yet at the same time, they're, they're creating uh, you know, the local vernacular written texts. Um, so in a way, you know, um, putting a setting a time bomb for you know, eventually uh, those, those areas, you know, developing uh, and preserving their own identity. So, you know, in Alaska, obviously they once Alaska became American, it was precisely, you know, looking back to the work of Ina Kenti in giving them their own, uh, their own local texts, um, that they, you know, they began to identify themselves uh, as Orthodox and, and they saw the kind of, the fact that they had their own alphabets and texts, um, you know, as something that was giving them an identity at the time when America was trying to uh, have you know English language schools and sending native children off to you know to learn in uh, in English language schools, um, and that's led to a lot of the the kind of native population, native peoples of Alaska today, you know, identifying very strongly with Orthodoxy and looking back particularly to that period. And and if I may add, Alison, they have their own saints being canonized by the Russian Orthodox yeah. Church, and that's that's massive, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think somebody who you know influenced my work and was a kind of a discovery for me, but helped me to make sense of all of this was you know was Lamin Sane, who I'm sure you know is a obviously a um, a big name in the world you know in the kind of world Christianity um, circuit uh, because. I think he he began well just helped me to see that this really was the pattern uh, in empires throughout the world really that um, you know whilst many of the missionaries may have gone out to uh, to kind of and were sort of passing on their own cultures um, just the fact that they were involved in in vernacular translation it, it brought them in far more into contact with local peoples and their cultures and. Um, and eventually, you know, gave the tools to um, to bring the empire down, really. And and in many ways, it was the same thing happening in Russia you know, to some extent. Yeah. More questions.
very nice to see Richard and Tamara Penwell. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> we have any more questions? No. So, uh, well, so in this, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, can we know about more about the IOTA missionary initiative? Romina asking again. Uh -huh. Well, um, I mean, I IOTA is uh, is the International Orthodox Theological Association. So it's a, a network of, uh, I mean, not just Orthodox scholars, uh, theologians, um, people of different professional backgrounds, um, trying to provide more kind of international networking, which is obviously one of the kind of major problems of the Orthodox Church for any people who know the kind of particular recent uh, major problems in the Orthodox Church. I mean, obviously, uh, yes, the Orthodox Church is is very much divided on national lines in many ways with with, uh, with not that much uh, international networking um, or subordinates, you could say. There's a kind of lack of subordinates, which is one reason why we're studying this topic of subordinates in, in Estonia and in Tartu. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the IOTA has different groups which are devoted to study of different areas of theology and life. So um, the, the group that I co-chair um, with Father Michael Alexa of Alaska, who's one of the main people who's written about the, the Alaskan church, um, is the missiology group, but there are many other groups um, about patristics or women in the church or all kinds of different groups, um, you know, uh, ecology, uh, so different kind of pressing issues of the uh, far day. Um, and the, uh, the next IOTA major conference will be in January 2023. So the call for papers will be going out for that conference. Um, so if anybody here, you know, would like to present a paper, please look on the IOTA website. Um, you know, you would be very welcome. It's, although it's largely Orthodox uh, theologians and scholars who, who will be meeting at the conference, it will be held in, in Volos in Greece. Um, and that's kind of COVID willing, but, um, you know, we hope very much it, it will be going ahead at the beginning of January, 2023. So um, yeah, please, you know, look on the IOTA website. Mm. I'll certainly make sure that all the updates that you have are circulated. Um, amongst uh, thank, the you. thank you, Lars. And um, mm. I think I'll, I'll make you a member of our group too. Then you have, uh, <laughs> yes, you get the invitations thank to you. similar um, yes, similar activities. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any any further questions, um, Simon? You look in a very curious, querent mood. <laughs> no. Um, eh, yes. Any? Oh, here we are. Yes. Who's the Who's that author who writes on Alaska? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, this is. Uh, just a minute. I'll put it in the chat. Michael um, this is he's a, an Orthodox priest in Alaska and uh, married to uh, he, his wife is from one of the Alaskan native peoples so he speaks several of the Alaskan native languages and he's been the the dean of uh, of the parishes there so it's travels around uh, Alaska and supporting the the priests in far-flung regions and um I mean, this this book is kind of 30 years 
uh, old now. I think it's based on his PhD thesis, uh, Orthodox Alaska, a theology of mission. So it gives both the, uh, the history of uh, the Orthodox Church in Alaska and, and he uses that to present his own theology of mission, as you can see. Sorry, Alyssa, I was just wondering, do we have it in the archives at SOAS? Because I did try to find everything on Orthodox missions at SOAS when I was writing a paper on that. And I, I don't think we had that book there, but I'm just worried, uh, wondering if we could get it. If not, is it, would you know, Alison, where we could get it from? I, I mean, I think it's, it was published by St. Vladimir's Seminary Press and I'm I pretty sure it's still in print because it's a very, uh, yeah, very significant book. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will chase it up and it, of course it's, um, so as the A is for Africa, not for America, but uh, they will uh, probably uh, hopefully be able to acquire it anyway. Um, oh, let's see. Um, no, I am checking. And I think much more historic, oh. history oriented than theology oriented at SOAS. Yes, so this yes. is, I think, something that yes, uh, yes. we might we might work towards improving, where we bridge the theological yes. with the historiographical, because I think those are intertwined, obviously. Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. I will, I will I will put it if you um, see that it's published. So you say it's in print at the moment. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. yes. Um, I look out for it and then uh, yeah. make sure that, I mean, I can um, order it on behalf of the center. So it's, um, you know, so it's related. Mm. Mm. Further questions? Mm. No, you, you don't know anything about the Tungusic uh, populations in, uh, in Russia, um, uh, how, how they are, because uh, that that I, I'm just familiar with the um, the, the initial encounters, and um, um, then the emphasis very, was very much on civilizing uh, the po populations who were. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, know, very, uh, I know that uh, in in Ilminski's letters, mm -hmm. he does discuss the the Tongus. I mean, he mm -hmm. he became someone who kind of was foisting his opinions really on everybody throughout the um, the Russian church towards the end of his life. So in many different situations, he, he was just really stressing this principle of using the local languages, you know, and um, yeah, you know, wherever possible. Um, so I, th I think in that sense, he did, uh, he did mention them, but I, I, I don't really know much about the, the modern day situation of them. Mm. If there are no more questions, then Romina, you? Uh, no, I mean, I don't want to um, extend this further. I'm sure people are, are busy, but I just, listening to Alison's few last comments, I was just thinking how, you know, in the work we do, I, I work in the Ethiopian Orthodox to Ahadu Church, and obviously I have to learn the languages and, you know, um, it communicate in the local languages with the communities in the context of the project I do. I work with Ethiopian Orthodox Church on uh, addressing domestic violence with the help of the clergy and theology. And so I always think, you know, what is what is the relevance of what I do to the concept of mission? Uh, because, you know, if you think about mission, even that concept needs to be decolonized in a way and revisited, which again, we, we, we raised in the previous volume. That is not just... Mm -hmm questioning uh, uh, colonialism and how that applies to each context, but also the very concept of mission. You know, as you, you, you are speaking about Father Michael, he lives in these communities. He, he, ha he has kind of become indigenous himself, in, in what, what we call in anthropology, becoming native in a way. Uh, I don't know to what extent this applies and how, how imbricated this is in colonial legacies to even speak in those terms. But, but what I'm trying to say is we live, you know, there are many of us who live in these communities and feel very much connected to these communities and do respect them and want and appreciate them and want to learn the languages and the lifestyle and so on. Um, and I just and I just wonder, you know, is that is that really mission or is that a type, a way of existence? I, I don't I don't know what you know what, how this could be framed better, but I'm trying to say that there is 
there is mission that has an intention and, an, and a certain standardized approach, and then there is a way of life. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it all boils down to the intention of the individual and their own ethos, mm -hmm. how they live, how they communicate and engage with these communities, because I don't think there is one type only. I think the individual really defines it. So anyways, just food for thought. I don't know how relevant this is, but uh, I thought it, it made sense to put it out there uh, in view of you know, the discussions we've been having. Yes. I mean, in the, um, in the Alaskan situation, I would say an example of somebody who really was just kind of you know, living, living his life really, um, but living a life kind of with God that in a way automatically drew people uh, to God uh, would be St. Herman of Alaska. Um, who was one of the the monks who went to live there? I mean, I I, I get the impression from uh, what I've read about him. I, I don't know that there is a lot of kind of really detailed information about how he lived, but um, you know, he he wasn't really there to kind of you know to to be a missionary. Um, in a way, he was just living his monastic lifestyle on on his island, and in a way that just Yes, as you say, his kind of his whole way of life, you know, people began to see his his holiness, uh, his prayerfulness um, and began to relate to him. So um, I think there is that uh, that kind of. Yeah, example that is is not just, yeah, not just kind of going out to be to be a missionary but uh, just being a missionary by who, who one is. Um, I mean, obviously there's the very famous lines from uh, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, you know, about, um, you know, acquire the Holy Spirit and thousands around you will be saved. Um, you know, in a sense that you don't necessarily need to go out and preach to everybody, but, um, you know, if you are, uh, acquiring the Holy Spirit, um, then you will inevitably, uh, you know, through through love, through through holiness, um, kind of become somebody who is a kind of a, a light and a, a source of kind of God's God's love and blessing uh, in the world. And you know, is a perfect word to end your, <laughs> your, your presentation today because um, they take us back to actually theology, you know, the core essence of, um, uh, of, of the Christian, Christian mission and then also the, our existences. Um, so it, it's, um, uh, it was a very interesting journey through history, but actually something that also unites us with the, the, the world today and the, um, the, the question of uh, the ecumenical, again, I would like to ask more, but maybe in Volos next year, that is actually a very, um, yes, that would be yes, a very good come, setting. Yes, very to Volos. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And anyway, so I, I think we'll um, draw a line here. And um, I would like to thank you so much for, for actually having uh, this time. And also, I, I was, um, uh, I mean, I can say that now maybe, but... Uh, um, over Christmas, I had not just, um, uh, I, I got COVID, so we were basically lo knocked out over yes. But then I also lost access to the um, uh, the, the SOA server, the, the list server that uh, controls the messages to the, the center. And um, uh, uh, when you got my message, that was the very day the very, that I managed to somehow get in through the side door. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I shared my worries with uh, Romina at that, uh, that point, you know, how can we notify people that, that your talk is coming up? <laughs> so, but, uh, but um, um, yes, it, it worked. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very yes. grateful yes. for that. Well, I mean, from my side too, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's all gone fine from the technical point of view, but actually where I am, we, we have a very bad internet connection and I, I've actually come around to a friend's flat where they have a better internet connection so really until I you know until I got online and did my screen share I had no idea really whether a I was going to be able to join with you and you know and secondly show my uh, show my slides so um, you know it's it's all been a bit precarious at my end too but I, I'm very very glad too that it's worked yeah. out and I'm very glad to meet you all yes. okay. thank you for your invitation
Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All. Bye. bye, everyone. Bye, Lars. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Lars. Bye. Thank you, Alison. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Alison.